Yes. Well, you're on the seventh floor. Okay, I'll go pick. Nice and warm after not 50, although not 50 degrees as in, uh, yeah, as in Iana, at least that's what my Iranian student used to say. Yeah, in the summer there, <laughs> 50 degrees. Please, I'm trying to set up. I uh, I advertised the, the uh, okay, your time. talk to your talk today also to some colleagues, to some colleagues uh, outside IST. Okay. And uh, I only got uh, an, a uh, message back, a reply from Kostas Pelakanakis. You know, he's a it's a Greek. He's oh. a Greek. He was a Milica Stojanovic's master student, okay. and he did his PhD. He went as a postdoc to Singapore, oh, okay. and now now he's at the NATO the NATO Center in uh, in Italy in La Spezia. Oh. Um, Oh. And so he's also very interested in in uh, in, in subband and filter bank and uh, and so he uh, I sent the announcement on Friday but he sent me only a message last night yeah I want to <laughs> I want to, to connect to the uh, to the uh, to the talk so I'm trying to uh, okay yeah, go out, ahead. I'm trying to figure out how I can <laughs> how I can do this um, Let's see. So is there teleconferencing in the room? Or? Yeah, the, the, the teleconferencing, the crew has a, has a video conference system, but uh, but so I was telling him that, uh, giving him the instructions on how to install the plugin. He's saying, well, it's not that simple because here it's military, so we need permissions for installing oh. software, etc. So I'm trying to do this on the via live events on YouTube. Uh, oh. The quality is going to be really crappy, but uh, anyways. Uh, uh, let's okay. see. Let's see if this works. And who will be my audience here? Well, I advertise this in, here in, uh, in ISR. Um, I, are, are there more the people? So, so you might, I don't know who's coming. Oh, okay, so no, I mean, uh, are there coming. people who are working in underwater? No, because no, no, no. uh, I can. One or two, one or two, uh, one or two people will have knowledge on the water communications, but most of, the, most of them will just be knowledgeable in telecommunications. Oh, okay. Can you can you without okay this uh, oh, for you uh, the last portion yes. okay it's lower a lowercase a uppercase u x p then lowercase y dash uppercase h w uh, w uh, yeah, W also uppercase. And then uh, the next three letters are lowercase Q A O. Q? Yeah. A O. It didn't work. You want me to read it again?
Thank you. Oh, okay. This is okay. Oh, the large delay. <laughs> it's a big delay. <laughs> wow. Okay. So, do we have audio? Second at least, or yes. more. Yes. Okay, it's, it's, it's better than nothing, and anyway, there's no way for him to uh, interact with us. Uh, yeah, so. Thank you. 
Why did it such a long delay? Like offering so. You couldn't do a Skype or something? No, he says, installing new software on my PC at CMRE, that's the NATO center, requires permission from the security office. It's not oh. as easy as you may think. Even to Skype, I need a special laptop. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I work with uh, one of the, you know, uh, one of the lab national labs in us and they can have a skype no uh, to top it's this always problem to top this off email is broken so we have to switch email. What's this?
this is okay now. Hopefully. Um. Shall we go upstairs? Okay. Yes, there's someone in the in the what robotics lab. I would like you to, uh, to have a look.
Okay, this is still broadcasting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's see if it costs So he's going to know, you know, after 30 seconds what you did. So. <laughs> okay, so we have. I don't know if it costs this. I sent him the slides. And so okay. he, uh, even though the, if, he, if he's able to connect, yeah, you can hear. He can hear, and then he can browse through the through the, the, the file. Sort of. Sort yeah. of okay. No, I, I actually I try to make it kind of easier for because I I was presenting this in uh, Dalhousie and. Over there, they had mostly students. So, <laughs> Dr. Scherger wanted me to make it, you know, as easy as possible and clear. So, that's why I went through steps of, you know, my list and things like that. You know, mm -hmm. to get yeah, beyond. One of the one of the reasons why I I really would like Costas uh, to see this. Is that since uh, since he's now at the uh, at the NATO center uh, with, a, with a keen interest on these topics, uh, actually that could be one of the uh, yeah. one of the possibilities uh, to frame a, a, a collaboration through through NATO. Yeah, no, that is sounds like. Let's 
the time now. Sorry? What's the time? It's 11. What am I doing? Oh, okay. It's interesting that cell phone here is one hour ahead. Mm -hmm. My cell phone, the time shows mm -hmm. like 12 now. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's, there's something. Yeah, I never, I never could figure out uh, why, why, why the configuration for the, yeah, for the time it's zone. A, it's, it's, it's a problem. We were confused the first. Thing. It's, it's a problem with the, with the, with the time zone. Uh, yeah. So for some reason, the network says that you are on, on, uh, on Central European time, which is not, which is not the case. Okay, shall we go? So, are you bringing your uh, your laptop? Or? Uh, I don't know. I should. Uh, yeah, I can use my laptop. If yeah. there's a, uh, Actually, borrow you the. I didn't even need to borrow an adapter. Turns out I have one. Okay. <laughs> on so, my drawer. Okay. So yeah. Th this is this is. Uh, no, I uh, actually I took it and I brought it home the other day to take it with me, and then somehow I forgot to, <laughs> you know. In my, you know, briefcase. <coughs> okay, so we're going down three floors to the fourth, the fourth floor. Uh, oh well, it doesn't seem that there's much audience right now. <laughs> so these are uh, these are Luis and uh, Vasco, with my students. So this is Veros, professor from the University of Utah. Uh, so let's see. Não, o, o, colega, o colega que se, que se ia ligar, estou a ver a conversa, diz-me que ele está no centro da NAP lá e tal. Sim, sim. Ah, não, não consigo instalar software, não consigo. Não, não, não. Portanto, eu pedi o 
período para fazer uma coisa alternativa e eu estou a fazer o, o, o broadcast uh, para, para o meu canal, para o meu canal do Infra Mirto. Então, nesse caso, de nesse caso de sim, pode ser que sim. sempre tem mais qualidade. Uhum. Ok, pois, assim, está bem. Pois, só que estas coisas, isto tudo muito em cima da hora é complicado. Isto já é complicado quando, quando vão em cima da hora. Então, em cima da hora, pior ainda. Pois, pois, pois. Então, nesse caso... Luís, tens o, tens o ar a ligar? Podes experimentar ligar-te a isto, ver se, se consegues ver aqui a transmissão. Ah, há os é, youtube.pe Tem uma latência de pelo menos 30 segundos neste momento. Sim. Neste momento eu já, já afinei. Okay. Já afinei. A... Ah, espera, mas isto está. Ah, está ao contrário. Yeah. É 30 segundos de pai de atraso. Ok, neste momento já se vê os slides, vê se o operador. Okay. 
should be where the contains the slots. few more minutes. So this is coming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
So we just we're waiting for one more minute, then, oh. we, then we start, I guess. Presents it, but I don't. I cannot read his message. <laughs> There's something wrong with the with the email server. Yes. So we're sitting in Italy. Sitting. Sorry. We're in Italy. Costa is. He's uh, in a place um, near near Portofino. You know, Portofino is the is in the, in the Italian Riviera. It's like the play the playground for the rich. It's okay. it's about sixty kilometers south of Genova. Yeah. Um, and so La Spezia is close to a couple places. Oh, it's, uh, okay. yeah, I know, I know that. There's a there's a former uh, NATO former no actually there's a NATO a NATO base there. Um, Seconds. What a, what a nice time for email to break down. Not to use Gmail. Yeah. Sure it's always it's always like this. When you need it to work, it doesn't. Okay, so whenever you're ready. Okay, no, I'm ready. Uh, 
Who's not there? Or? I cannot tell. He sent me a message, um, but our email server is uh, is broken, so I cannot read it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing works. Okay. Yeah. So I he, hopefully yes, he sent oh, this as, as eleven ten. So after I I had sent him the link. So okay. So anyway, yeah. Let me start. So I decided to divide the talk that I'm giving to three parts, mainly. Uh, I just assume that not everybody knows filter bank. Therefore, mm -hmm. I go through uh, filter bank. And then uh, in part two, I present a design that one of my PhD students did a few years ago. And we wrote a few conference paper and uh, one journal paper that thanks to Joao that handled the review of that paper and eventually came out, I think this year. Uh, and then uh, part three is kind of my vision for further research in coming years. So, uh, starting with part one, filter bank multi carrier methods. Uh, this diagram is a generic view of multi carrier systems. And this actually covers also the widely used OFDM method, but it has more into it. So, you can Imagine here that I have a number of symbol sequences going through the system in parallel. And by choosing these symbols, you know, rates at each substream to be low enough, you can make assumption that the channel is narrow band enough so that it can be approximated with a a uh, single complex gain or a flat gain, which is actually is not necessary to be the case. There are ways that we can do more complex equalization as well, but just to make equalization simple, that is uh, the assumption that we made in the work that I'm going to present. So, and then at the receiver, you have a mesh filter to what you have at the transmitter and you uh, sample the signal at the output at the symbol rate, and you get your <coughs> good estimate of your data symbols. So when I think of OFDM, or in general, multi-carrier filter um, communication, you can imagine that you have a grid of points in time frequency space, and at each of the indicated points, the dots, blue color here, uh, we are transmitting one signal. So I am transmitting symbols in the two-dimensional space. The symbols are spaced in time by T, in frequency by F, and if we are specifically talking about OFDM, then uh, the T FFT is smaller than T, and the remaining part actually is the cyclic prefix. If you have seen OFTN, so <clears throat> one of the key points uh, that should be reminded here is that in OFTM we have, you know, the prototype. The filter that we have is a rectangular pulse, the purple color shown. <laughs> and effectively, each symbol sits at the top of a sinusoid, complex sinusoid, and we transmit. And we transmit multiple of these symbols 
uh, in parallel. Uh, so if you think of, you know, complex sine wave, when a sine wave goes through a linear system, the output of the system also is a sine wave, affected by the gain of the channel or the system at that particular uh, frequency. So, however, we say that when input is sine wave, the output is sine wave after passing the transient time of the... So there is some transient as shown here, and then after that, we have reached a steady state, and if you grab the signal over a window after the steady state, then we can separate sine waves from each other provided that they have some specific distance. So, uh, again, in OFDM, we use uh, IFT, FFT at the transmitter to sum up the sine wave together, and then at the receiver, we use a FFT to separate them. So this FFT length here should be over the flat one. So one of the key points that I want to emphasize here is that we assume that the system is time invariant, okay? So when we talk about OFDM, OFDM works under time invariant uh, channels. And related to underwater in particular, this suddenly become a wrong or invalid assumption for most of the underwater channels, because underwater channels change so fast that, uh, you know, definitely there will be some variation in the channel and that is going to, you know, mess up the signal set. Okay. So this is a point to be noted and that actually is a kind of introduction to why I am proposing filter. So uh, uh, this kind of busy slide, uh, look through or uh, remind us of three types of filter bank that exist out there. One is FMT, which is called, uh, you know, a filtered multi-tone. What it is, FMT is you divide your frequency band to isolated portion and you transmit your signal over them. So there's actually a guard band between different subcarriers. So there's some inefficiency in terms of transmission. Then we have a uh, multi-carrier based on offset QAM, or uh, I like to call it the staggered modulated multi-tone, or SMT, where you push the carrier into each other, bring them closer to each other. Therefore, you get maximum gain or band deficiency that you have. And CMT is very similar to a staggered uh, modulated multi-tone, or this is cosine modulated multi-tone, uh, with some small, you know, modification uh, to go from one case to the other. So, again, I have a few more business like you need not to pay too much attention to the detail, but basically uh, in FMT we have subcarriers, you know, separated in bands, but when you look at SMT or uh, CMT, you find that they are overlapped. Therefore, you can pack more subcarrier in a limited bandwidth that you have. Okay. So, <clears throat> uh, CMT is very similar to SMT, and in fact, CMT was the one that was invented first, and then SMT or offset QAM followed that, and the way that, uh, you know, CMT was 
introduced by Chang in 1965 in Belle was to say that, okay, I can transmit PAM symbols, pulse amplitude modulated symbols, or real value symbols, not QAM symbols, by doing vestigial sideband modulation. And then, in addition to that, what you do, since we are transmitting real symbols to make sure that the symbols which are side by side in frequency as well as side by side in time, you introduce a phase shift of pi over two between every each pair of adjacent symbols, both along time and along frequency. Okay. Okay. That's the way that it works. So if you go to OQAM also is doing the same thing. It just take a QAM symbol and take the real part and then the imaginary part and then the real part is sent with a phase of zero. The imaginary part sent with a phase of 90 degrees. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, uh, but there is more detail into this and I have written a couple of papers, you know, to clarify this because I've seen that sometimes there is some confusion in the literature and some of the discussion about uh, particularly CMT, it seems that it's not very well understood in my view because some comments doesn't make sense, some people can be talked about it. Uh, so if you just search for my publication, I have one main publication that appeared in 2011 in Sigma Processing Magazine, so that one has a good review of filter band technique and compare CMT and SMT uh, with each other. I have also written one paper in Eurasi, which is kind of review, and there I go more into detail of comparing CMT and SMT. So if you just search for my publication and CMT, SMT, you will definitely find it. Okay, so, uh, I want to briefly mention uh, CMT in a bit more detail. The way that we do modulation in CMT is vestigial size. So basically you get the baseband signal that you want to transmit and then you cut off half of it through a symmetric filter uh, here on the positive side and then you <coughs> take the right side of it and put it here and then if you take the real part of it the image of it will be equivalent to the left side mm -hmm. okay and now if you have multiple uh, streams that you want to transmit each of these streams you cut off a vestigial side part of it and put it here and the next M sequence and so on, you just put them side by side and you can transmit this. Okay, so the reason that I emphasize on CMT become clear in the third part of my talk. So for the time being, I complete this first part of the presentation and go into a specific design of FBMC for doubly dispersive underwater acoustic channel. Okay. Uh, I start simple and say if I'm transmitting single carrier stream, then each symbol is transmitted at one of the blue dots here at time space of t. And for the purpose of signaling and transmission over band limited channel, what we do is that we actually design our filtering at transmitter and receiver such that the combination of both will be a Nyquist. That's what we do. <clears throat> so, 
So each of the transmit and receive filters are a, a square root of Nyquist filter, a square foot root in frequency domain. So you design your filter to be Nyquist uh, in time domain equivalent. Also, you have some frequency <coughs> response in frequency domain, and then you take a square root of that, and that actually determines frequency response of your pulse shape at the transmitter and uh, also at the receiver. Okay, now let's generalize this and think of uh, our signaling when we are we want to transmit in two-dimensional space. <coughs> Now I have to design my transmit and receive filter, the pair of transmit and receive filter, such that I don't have any interference along the time, as well as no interference along the frequency. So I want to be free of ISI, intersymbol interference, and ICI, intercarrier interference. So it becomes a little more, a bit more complex if you want to think of it. But is mathematically you can write equations and uh, come up with the design. Okay. Uh, yeah, specifically, let me mention that here I am talking about FMT, not CMT. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, up to here, actually, it was more general. And if I look at OFDM, what I do in OFDM is that I add the cyclic prefix to separate the successive symbols in time. Therefore, I resolve the ISI by using CP. And then by putting the spacing here in frequency equal to the length of window that I pick up at the receiver, which is the size of the FFT, length of the FFT, then the sine waves, which are at different frequencies, will be orthogonal. Mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, you can solve the problem of uh, ICI in this way. <coughs> But as I mentioned earlier, OFDM definitely is not a good choice. So I want to do something else, and uh, that is how I'm going to proceed. So let's go back to our one-dimensional case and say that I design my transmit and receive filter such that when they multiply together, give me a night twist passion. So, if I look at this in more detail in time domain, then you can say that I have some pulse H of T, which is a S square root Nyquist pulse at the transmitter that I use and use the same pulse for the receiver. And I choose this particular pulse shape so that when I look at such, you know, any pair of H of T delayed by M, T, or N, T, if M and N are equal, then the inner product of these two uh, pulses, meaning we just multiply and integrate, is equal to 1 if M is equal to N. If M is not equal to N, then the inner product is equal to 0. So you can think of it as a vector space and say that, okay, these vectors are a set of orthogonal bases. So I actually synthesize my signal by using this set of orthogonal bases. And the Nyquist condition is that I choose H of T such that when I convolve it with itself, it gives me a G of T, and G of T has this property. It's equal to 1 at the middle and at every uh, point of or spacing of capital T, it passes through a 0, satisfies 
night to start the show. Mm -hmm. So next I want to generalize this to my two-dimensional uh, sequence that I just made. If you notice this equation is different from the previous one, I have a sequence of S of N, but there is a subscript of K also, which is specify different frequencies. And now my pulse H also is characterized with, you know, saying H of T, but we have additional subscript of K, which is specified that H at different subcategories. Now, if I look at H, at different time as well as a different subcarrier, then I should have this condition, which means that again I have a set of basis function that are orthogonal with each other, both along the time and along frequency. So the way to write this down mathematically to cover both. Uh, time spreading or transmission along time as well as spreading of the sequences along the frequency is to use this function which is called the ambiguity function. So if you take note of this function, actually it correlates H and its shifted version of it in time, as well as introduce some shift in the frequency in one of these, you can imagine something like that. So you have time as well as frequency, tau and d. Now, if you look at this ambiguity function in more detail, you would find that the Nyquist condition or generalized Nyquist condition here will be to say that my ambiguity function, if sampled at interval of t in time and interval of capital F in frequency, then it is equal to 1 at the middle and is equal to 0 at other degree points. So if you again think of this two-dimensional space and try to compare it with uh, what I said earlier for a one-dimensional case. In one-dimensional case, what we have, you know, you have a function like this. Now, if you have a multiple sequences here, also in frequency, then the Nyquist function that you use is going to be a three-dimensional surface, yeah? And it's going to have nulls it's equal to one at the middle and has nulls at all other points in time as well as in frequency. And I'm going to show you some of these, uh, you know, kind of surf plots. Okay. Uh, now, again, Think of Nyquist pulse. If Nyquist pulse goes through a multi path channel, what will happen? You get multiple copies of the Nyquist overlapped and added together. And then Nyquist property will be lost. In the same way, when we look at the ambiguity function, which is time frequency spread and pass through a channel which has a spreading in time as well as a spreading in frequency, then our surface is going to be kind of mixed up because of uh, spreading both in time and frequency. Now, if you look at Ambiguity function for OFDM is the 3D plot that I have on the left side here. And now you can imagine that multi-paths that I have here is going to disturb the nulls 
that they have across time. Mm -hmm. So for some good Nyquist uh, or generalized Nyquist design that I use in time frequency, I have this kind of plot here. So I have, again, nodes along the time as well as along the frequency. And then the effect of my channel is going to kind of spread this. And it's, uh, the nodes here will be affected. And I want to design possibly a, a pulse shaping filter that minimizes the, uh, you know, losing the nodes. Because anyway, I will lose the nodes, but I, I don't want to lose them that much. Mm -hmm. Okay, is that clear? Getting confused? <laughs> Stop. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, again, looking at uh, channel spreading function, it's a kind of, again, the best is to think of multi-path channel, you know, because multi-path is kind of easy, one dimensional to look at it. But so it's kind of spread the pulse that we have in time multiple copies of that, and they will add up together so it doesn't have Nyquist property. Similarly, in the two-dimensional, also you have a spreading time and you have spreading influence. So I have to do something about it. So, you can simplify the you know, a spreading that might be some strange shape and approximated by a, you know, ellipse kind of thing. It's just more like a circle, but it might be a stretch, you know, mm -hmm. dimension. But so you're, you're, uh, you're ignoring the, the fine structure inside yeah. the, that, uh, that area. Uh, in, of in the, the real, in spreading real. function. Yeah, I, I yeah, see but, that. But, but so in 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 a, in a water and the water channel, it, it it won't be just one peak that is smeared in time and frequency. There will be several ones, but you are ignoring this and you are just taking. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of smoothen it and say that okay, let me just think of it this mm -hmm. way and uh, do come up with my design this way, and then later on, I just apply this to a real underwater channel and see mm -hmm. what I get. Okay, so uh, when we look at the pulse shape H of T, or the S squared root Nyquist, or more generalized form of it, uh, that we are going to design related to this pulse, there are two functions here that I define the time spread and frequency spread. So basically, I say that, I assume that this pulse is centered at zero. And I say that if I multiply it by T squared, and this pulse, if it goes to zero very fast, then sigma T is going to be a smart. And similarly, if my pulse goes to zero very fast along the frequency, sigma f also will be uh, small. Mm -hmm. So that would be something uh, good for our design to have. OK. When we think of uh, our pulse shape and the spreading of the function in time and frequency, if 
even though this is not a very, you know, uh, theoretically true and accurate statement, but it's reasonable to imagine that spreading of the function in time and frequency should be related to how much spreading our channel has in time and frequency. So specifically delta tau and delta f that I have, if you have already forgotten one of the uh, things that I showed just earlier, is related to how much spreading I have here in time and frequency. Okay. Uh, so when you say that your channel has spreading both in time and frequency, and you want to design a pulse shape to handle that well, you may think of designing a pulse that the way that is it is spread along the time and the way that is it spreads along the frequency will be kind of similar. You treat both time and frequency similarly. So I, it has been proposed that good results is expected if I design my pause in time domain H of T, lowercase h of T, such that its Fourier transform capital H of F will be a similar function, but there might be a proportionately proportional con constant of the variable f here, which I have indicated by f. Okay, so and this relates nicely with the three D plot that I showed earlier. You see that symmetry. So I said, okay, I want the spreading here and spreading here to be treated similarly. So I go with that design. <coughs> of course, you may have a spreading in time more than a spreading in frequency, then you stretch this along the time. And the co coefficient L that I've introduced in uh, this equation here relates to that. So, <clears throat> a final note here is that I like to spread my data symbols along the time with the spacing of T and along frequency with the spacing of F such that these two will be proportionate to how much spreading I have in time or how much spreading I have in frequency. <coughs> so again, looking at Nyquist pulse that we have, if I have too much spreading in time or my spreading in time is large, then I rather to keep the, my function kind of wider in time so that when the spreading happen and it's disturbing my zero will be disturbed less because if my t is very small and this is very sharp and then i have widely spaced multipath then my pulse is going to be very badly affected so that's one way of looking at it so i have this relationship here and I use this for my design. Okay. The, there is a terminology that is used for filters that satisfy the similarity of the pulse in time and frequency. And that is the term isotropic filters. So we say a filter isotropic if it has the same shape in time 
and in frequency. So and I can actually start with value of L equal to one, and then by just time scaling in time by any factor, the reverse of that scale will be applied in frequency. And you know, I can have values of L which are not necessarily equal to one. Okay. So what are isotropy functions? One well-known isotropic function that I hope you remember your Fourier transform table. Okay? Usually this appears in the last line of the Fourier transform table. Mm -hmm. The Gaussian part has Fourier transform, which is exactly the same function. Okay. It also appears sometimes in, in exams. <laughs> and sometimes also appears in exams, so it's a good way of making sure that the students remember that. So, so this particular function has this property. Another very interesting property of uh, Gaussian function with the factor of pi here is this. Actually, factor of pi I think is not necessary because you can scale it in time and frequency and all this this property. So the Heisenberg cover uncertainty principle states that for an arbitrary fun pulse h of t, if you take the multiplication of h of uh, sigma of t and sigma of f that I defined earlier, which actually determine how your function is limited in time and how your function is limited in frequency, then this multiplication is always greater than or equal to 1 over 4 pi. Equality holds here when h of t is equal to our Gaussian pulse. So the Gaussian pulse is isotropic as well as it has minimum dispersion in combined time and frequency. However, and this of course is a maximize the compactness, however, G of T is doesn't hold the property of a square root Nyquist that we need. Okay? So if you convolve it itself, definitely it's not going to have regular zero crossing that we need. Mm -hmm. Okay. Again, we want to look at a pulse that its ambiguity function has value of one at the middle and has regular zero crossing in all the points of the rest of the plane. Okay. There is one uh, interesting algorithm that was patented in 96 that says that if you take the Gaussian pulse and apply this transformation to it, it's kind of a strange transformation, Mm -hmm. And uh, there is some good uh, literature that or papers that talk about the proof of this. It's not really that difficult to prove it. If you apply this O function or orthogonal function on G of T, and by properly choosing the value of A, which you want to choose it equal to F, then you make sure that in frequency domain you have zero regular zero crossing. And then you go and apply a Fourier transform to the results, and then you apply another orthogonalization to it to fix the zero crossing at T space. And then you finally take an inverse Fourier transform and you get your HST. Okay. 
<laughs> it's kind of magic. Yes. But uh, it has been, design has been presented and it works and, you know, it's, uh, this is known as IOTA partial. And IOTA stands for Isotropic Orthogonal Transform Elbert. So, uh, we decided to do it differently. And not us, actually, prior to our work, you know, almost immediately after uh, publication of IOTA, uh, Hassan Belfio, they came up with another way of designing pulse shapes which are satisfied in maximum compactness and time frequency. So remember that the patent was 96, probably was filed three years before that. But just within a couple of years, there was this paper that came out and said that actually I can design my H of T by linearly combining a set of Hermit functions. It turns out that if you start with your Gaussian pulse and you take the derivatives of the Gaussian pulse, you know, those will give you, according to this equation here, uh, those will give you the uh, Hermit functions. And the Hermit function of order zero is the Gaussian pulse. And then every fourth order, if you proceed and you look at these pulses, you find that these pulses are also isotropic, meaning that the Fourier transform is the same function as the original function. Mm -hmm. So what uh, was done in this paper here <laughs> by Hassan Belfiar was that they said, that, okay, I can take a few of these pulses that are decaying also pretty fast to zero and linearly combine them and I choose the coefficients A, K here such that those zero crossings will be satisfied. So we said that, okay, we can use also this design. But the idea that we had a few years ago was that, you know, the nulls which are generated, you know, after applying the channel are no longer nulls because it's just you are shaking your ambiguity function. So the nulls, become blurred. <coughs> we then said that, okay, I may not want to impose perfect nulls. I rather to have some approximate nulls which are kind of wider so that when dispersion in time frequency happen, the nulls which are not super null, they are not absolute zero, but they are minus 40 dB, they remain about minus 40 dB. So that, that was the main idea for the design. So we came and, you know, wrote some equation and at each of the points here, we introduced a broad null broad approximate. Uh, I have different uh, indication here in this time frequency plan here. I have some, uh, uh, you know, uh, solid uh, circles here that I should impose my knots. And then I have other, you know, circles which are not filled up or they are kind of uh, just white circles here. These 
when I'm using my hermit function, hermit function decay to zero so fast that I don't need to worry about these when I'm designing my design. And then among these solid points, I have indicated a few with the additional circle around. And I argue that if I satisfy or my design goes at these points, then the rest of the points, because of the isotropic property, mm -hmm. will be naturally satisfied because my pulse is symmetric in time. So if I satisfy good nulls here, naturally the same nulls also will be generated here. And the 90 degree rotation also give me the same thing because my pulse is isotropic. So then uh, I limited the number of points that I need to explore to only these four points. At the middle, my uh, ambiguity function, the, you know, you start with h of d, t, and then you define your a function has to be equal to one here, and you need to have kind of broad zeros here. What I mean by broad zeros is that I actually impose minimizing the ambiguity function at these points and other points surrounding. So I kind of define an area that I want my function to go as low as possible. How low it will be, my design is going to tell me. So anyway, the detail of this design is uh, given in this paper. So it just appeared in January. Mm -hmm. Took a while. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, this is a example of the design that we have. It's kind of exaggerated in this diagram here because uh, the way that you know, this particular design is for very low efficiency, but it shows how, uh, you know, the idea. How does it work? So this is a ideal nulls that we have, and these are broader approximate nulls that I was talking about. Okay. Now, if I apply my channel, what will happen is that this is going to be shifted along the time and multiple copies will be added together. So if the shift is, you know, within this range here, there will be a good knowledge still at the middle. Why, when I apply to this one, you will see that it's not as good. So, this is the result of applying the chain. The one with the perfect null, now it has null points which are about 34 dB, minus 34 dB. Why? In this design that I have, I am minus 42 dB. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so even though I start with a bad design with respect to satisfying the uh, Nyquist or generalized Nyquist condition, after the spreading of the channel is introduced, I see that I, you know, it's kind of, you know, ad hoc design in some sense. But it's something that, you know, in a very intuitive sense, we can see that it should have a good effect or good performance in practice. The, the, um, <coughs> so this region where you are trying to to uh, to impose zero on the on, yeah. on this response. Uh, so the length of this region is related to the to the, uh, to the to delay and Doppler spread of the a Doppler or time of Doppler spread. And, and can you can this can you actually make this work for spread that is uh, relevant in in, uh, in uh, underwater channels uh, the, so the things match up so that's what we did so say in time for instance 
we assume that our symbols are being transmitted every one tenth of the sec of a second. And then the time spreading of underwater, we say that is in the order of 10 millisecond. Okay. Which is 10 times smaller. Right. So if I make this width here to be 10 times smaller than the width here, I will. <coughs> Okay. And of course, if I if I have a channel that it, it has more spreading, then I may mm -hmm. not do as good as I expect. Right. But and for the for the frequency for the frequency spread, you also uh, match for to the frequency a, spread also similar. You also match to accommodate yeah. if your Doppler so spread is something on the order of one hertz. Yeah, we, you're okay with this. We do our design looking at it, you know, symmetric like this, but these are kind of normal. So by choosing my time, whatever I want, one over that time is going to be my frequency. So if I choose my uh, t equal to uh, 0.1 second, then uh, the spacing in frequency is going to be 10 hertz. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is kind of limited by my design. So this uh, diagram uh, shows the signal to interference ratio. So I have an ideal channel, no noise, simulated channel, and I have multi-path in time over time period of delta tau, and I have multiple, you know, I think, maybe we had like 10 of them, uniformly spread, and the amplitudes were random, but uh, with similar distribution. In actual channel, maybe we have more exponential decays, uh, HF channel or it's underwater channel, you probably have a line of sight which is stronger than others, and then you have some reflection in chart, mm -hmm. uh, you know, smaller than amplitude. But th th this particular, uh, s you know, simulation that we have done here is that the channel has been produced as a multi-path with a number of paths spread over delta tau, and all of them have statistically the same. And the time variation of the paths are such that I get some value for delta tau uh, times delta mu. And this, uh, as a parameter, has changed between 0 and 0 0.1. Mm -hmm. Then I have results here for, uh, first of all, different uh, efficiency factor, B. Just call it B, not very good name. But uh, so when I talk about B equal to one half in the case of OFDM, it means that the length of FFD and the length of CP is the same. So half of my resources actually is used for CP, which is kind of very low efficiency. But then by doing that and saying that the length of CP is equal to the length of the channel, which I assume to be 10 millisecond, then the variation of channel over the length of FFT is not that much. Therefore, you get a good result here, even though the filter bank is, of course, a lot better. So when I talk about D equal to 4 over 5, that means that uh, CP length is 1 over uh, four, one fourth of the length of my FFT, or in other words, the TFFT is four times greater than length of CP. And then uh, time variation of the channel actually destroys OFTM. And you see that SIR goes pretty long. Mm -hmm. Of course, if you go to lower 
uh, dispersion, then OSTM expectedly perform better because OSTM was designed when the channel is not time varying or very slowly changing. <coughs> uh, so, and then uh, I have here a few different plots here, which I have to explain. This is uh, the blue line here is FMT conventional, which is just normal design of FMT without paying attention to, uh, you know, isotropic property. Then the red one here, the dotted, uh, the dashed, is FMT, which has been designed for doubly dispersive chain, the way that we, I kind of expanded the knots. And then the purple one that I have never had any chance to run experiment on it is uh, designed for doubly dispersive, however, the placement of the points in the time frequency space are in hexagonal form as compared to the other, which is rectangle. So far, what I presented to you was that the points were placed in a rectangular lattice. Mm -hmm. It turns out that you can actually design your pulse shape and for the case where the placements are at the center of hexagonals. When you have points in the center of hexagonals, then uh, for the same density, the distance between points become larger. But uh, the, uh, the rectangular grid, the rectangular lattice, this comes about uh, because of the um, Nyquist property that, yeah. that, you, that you need. But what, what actually, I, 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 we have a design uh, methodology that we can come up with a hexagonal placement. Okay. As I said, the results of underwater that we have done, and I can present here, is only four uh, rectangular, but it's interesting if we can get the chance to run some simulation to get the hexagonal also example. And it seems that hexagonal, at least according to the results that I have, uh, here, you have actually significant gain in all cases. Of course, the case of uh, interest to us probably is equal to four or five because we don't have one equal to very low efficiency. And you see here that between OFDM and uh, rectangular double dispersive design, we jump up by maybe 5 dB, but we have another couple of dB to gain if you go to hexagon. It's quite a bit, so maybe almost 3 dB? Oh, he, he, here is, yeah, it's a lot. When you talk about very low efficiency. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, and maybe in underwater, if your channel is very bad, you may want to go for very uh, low efficiency case. Okay. So this is a summary of uh, what we have done in uh, one of the experiments that was run for us maybe four years ago. Uh, yeah, in 2010, five years ago, ECOM 10. Who was organizing this? Uh, this was uh, ONR, actually. Yeah. And uh, I know that there were a lot of contributors to that experiment, but mm -hmm. very little have been published. Because most people were doing OFDM still, or some higher mobility, mm -hmm. and 
as our results shows OFM phase mystery. So naturally, they ended up not publishing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyway, uh, for the particular design that we used with very little experience, particularly five years ago, it was the time that I had started maybe just one year into doing my research in underwater. Uh, we put the subcarrier spacing based on some of other paper around 12 hertz. We had 399 subcarriers. The center frequency that, of course, was given to us by the experiment was 20 kilohertz. We used a rate half convolutional code with the uh, polynomials given here. Uh, so if you guys are not familiar with some of the detail here, don't worry about it. What I want to present is that, you know, uh, the power of filter. And we tried the QPSK, 8PSK, and 16 quam constellations. Uh, we've been able to transmit 49, or they did that for us, 49 code words. Each of them contained 4,560 symbols. So the number of bits, depending on constellation, will change. And the way that we arranged our subcarriers was that we had data, 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 and then one pilot. Again, three data, one pilot. And, you know, quite a bit of uh, resources is used for pilots and in the third part of my talk, actually, I will talk about the possibility of removing pilots, therefore, to get more efficiency. What do you use the, the null for? Uh, actually, we put the nulls there in case we have a uh, doctor scaling to deal with that, but in this experiment, there was no mobility. Mm -hmm. It was just binary. Okay. So, the next few slides show our performance against OFT. So this is rectangular lattice, doubly dispersive design. Uh, the left hand side is when we examine four hydrophones, and the right side when we have we make use of all eight hydrophones that we had in the experiment. So as you see here, uh, the FMTDD detect more of the, you know, uh, packets correctly. Uh, of course, when you have eight antenna OFTM, it's not bad in this case, which is QPSK. Next, if I look at APSK, then you see that OFDM has hard time to catch up. But for this, still with eight hydrophone at the receiver side, all 49 code words will be detected, are detected correctly. And in, if we go for a more complex case of 16 quam, then you see that OFDM really fails miserably. Even with high, eight hydrophones, only two out of, two or three out of 49 are detected correctly and then the rest mm -hmm. uh, have some error. The way, that, the way that you combine multiple hydrophones in a, in a in filter bank, uh, it, it's the same as in as in OFDM, so you're taking the... Yeah. Doing, so MSC, when we did that, combining. Uh, out of 49, 45 are detected correctly. Yeah, but, but, uh, but the, 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 the criterion for uh, for uh, combining the several hydrophones, okay. is it this, in, uh, in FMT, is it the same as you, as you yeah, do in, in OFDM? Exactly the same. It's just, it's just kind of, you know, adaptive filter and mm -hmm. maximum ratio combining. Okay. No difference. And... Anyway, thanks to you, these are your suggestions that we added later mm -hmm. in the paper. So this is a, a showing the 
signal to interference noise ratio uh, comparison between OFTM and FMT designed for W dispersive channels. And this is with one hydrophone, and this is with eight hydrophone. And what you see here in terms of distribution, you see a difference of 10 dB that we have seen for this experiment. Okay? So we didn't see that much on the curves that I, I represented because they were just simulation. And this was really harsh scenario that the experiment happened and demonstrated that actually I'm very glad that it was like that because mm -hmm. later on we run another experiment and we were trying to do the Doppler scaling where the vehicles are moved with respect to each other and the time and scale changes. So you have to fix that as well. But the, that experiment was very benign one and, you know, we didn't see that much of difference between OFD and yeah. But so in, the, in, this, in this particular um, experiment, yeah. so the, the configuration was static? Yeah, so it was have, static. So the, the channel variations... But, but the channel from, variation apparently was... Coming different. from the motion of the of the, of yeah. the rays and the yeah. surface, the usual, usual sources of line variation. But probably it was a stormy day or... Mm -hmm. the you don't have the, uh, the uh, delay, the uh, empirical delay Doppler spread functions for uh, this... Uh, we then go into detail to measure that, and you know, and also our packets were not designed for that kind of measurement. Yeah, but maybe in, in the in this experiment, someone else transmitted uh, like chirps yeah, yeah, that you that yeah. you can correlate and uh, and get get the, the I haven't function. followed since last year. I should confess, mm -hmm. but until last year, we didn't see anybody publish it. Much of this to say that how bad is this channel. But, but from the results that we have, uh, I mean, we did our best to extract the information out of OFTM and filter them both. It was very similar at Oregon, and OFTM seemed to fail, which is kind of against many of other publications uh, that we have seen. And by that, my conclusion is that this channel was a very bad channel. Okay, so anyway, uh, there are some additional ideas that i uh, been thinking about more recently, and uh, uh, actually I've been talking to Joao as well as uh, another colleague in Canada about this was to see if we can come up with even better design with filter bank computation. So one of the one idea that you know has been at the back of my mind and actually relate to some work that I did almost 15 years ago is that in the case of, I'll try to stay here. <laughs> uh, in the case of CMT, this is a model for one of the subcarriers. What we have here is that your data symbol sequence is going through a residual sideband filter, and then the channel is going to affect that and then you use a mesh filter at the receiver, and then you have a single tap equalizer to do equalization. And then since the data symbol that we have transmitted are real, after equalizer, you take the real part to extract the data symbol. Uh, one interesting property that CMT has is this. If I look at signal 
before equalization here. And I take the real part of this. Usually what I see is a kind of Gaussian distribution of the value. And the reason that it is Gaussian is that without equalization, I have a mix of interference. ISI and ICI because of the overlapping of the filters in time and frequency. But if I do the equalization correct and then take the real part, then I, my constellation will pop up. But the, your single tap, your single single tap equalization. Yeah. All that it can do is to rotate. It's the, rotating. So it cannot be it cannot be interference from, no, from the, other, other other carriers. So what the way to think about it is this is that I have a signal. Excellent. which is complex. So this actually is my symbol that I have transmitted. And it has some imaginary part which comes from ISI and ICI. Okay. Now, the channel gain has been multiplied by this. And this is as real and imaginary. So this is going to be GR times S of N minus GI times ISI plus ICI plus J some other time. So if I take the real <laughs> part of my received signal without equalization, I have a combination of the actual symbol that I want to extract plus terms which are coming from ISI and IC. So in this variant, so I'm, I'm more familiar with FMT, so maybe I'm missing something here. But so in CMT, the imaginary part doesn't uh, doesn't uh, encode useful information and so uh, it could have large values for example and it doesn't matter it doesn't matter. Uh, okay. I, I can uh, mention something about that information that actually we are throwing away okay it might be useful if you use it in some uh, more optimal detection but the common thing that is done is that you just look at real part and say, okay, that's my information, and this is the imaginary part that I drew. So you get this one, and then what you do is that you pass this through equalizer. Mm -hmm. Now, if equalizer is set equal to one over G, then after I take the real part, my constellation, the PAM constellation will pop up. Mm -hmm. So what I can do is that I can take the signal here, multiply it by W, and take the real part, and then define some proper function that I can use to feedback and adjust W. So it turns out that 
there's a famous work by Godard in 1980 that I think you should definitely, I'm sure, you're yeah. familiar mm -hmm. So this is a cost function, is the one which is defined at the top. And by minimizing the cost function psi, then when choosing R according to this equation, if you minimize it, you go from Gaussian to your, you know, constellation, which are M or in general. But the, the, the cost here is to, to get an output that has constant uh, modules, which is not exactly what you want here, but there uh, are variants. Uh, no, actually, the Godard algorithm applies also to Quan in general. And people have done that. Ah. I, I use it for the PAM. Ah, oh, yeah. So you're 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 running this algorithm after yeah. on the signal after the taking the uh, real after part. taking the real. Okay. So anyway, so we run this algorithm and you are. I, I wrote a paper that appeared in Transaction Com in two thousand three, but the work actually was done a couple of years before that because of the delay of publication. So. The idea that right now I have, or I'm thinking that it should work, is to apply this to underwater communication. So I can get rid of FMT transient bands. So that would be, and also by doing this, I need not to use pilot for tracking. So I will gain both in avoiding my uh, transient band as well as not using pilots. How do you do those pilots that you were showing in, in that um, in the previous slide? So they were inserted one every four every yeah. for some subcarriers. So you're doing the channel estimation with those pilots in the in the classical way, so take the set of pilots, estimate channel. Yeah, Next time you 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 get another symbol, uh, do the same. Do the same thing. And, yeah, and so yeah. there's, there's uh, no there's no tracking. No, of, we, of we actually apply some tracking also in order to, but the underwater variation is so fast that you know you have to forget very fast the past because the channel has changed after a couple of. Just two, three symbols, you know. Mm -hmm. You're in the area. New channel. But there's a, the uh, Melissa Stojanovic, her take on uh, on OFTM. She uses she uses channel uh, channel tracking. But so so she she explicitly uh, tracks the phase, the phase of the of the of the channel, which is the one, the yeah. quantity that that varies most uh, rapidly. So she has dedicated subsystem to track the, the, the phase, and then what remains is much slower than uh, the remaining components of the impulse response of the channel. Response of the channel are much slower, and, and so you can recursively uh, do some track. Yeah, yeah, I mean definitely there are other you know method that you can deal mm -hmm. with there. But, but the fact that OFTM is sensitive to Time variation it exists no matter what. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so the same concept actually can be applied to filter band. Mm -hmm. I imagine. Yes. Uh, so uh, we realize that even though we use this one for single tap, you know, the original suggestion was for single tap. When I have multiple hydrophone at the receiver, <laughs> I can apply the same. However, for the this blind algorithm to work, especially in underwater, that the variation is fast, we need to kind of initialize the tab weights correctly. So what we have done a bit of work one of my students has tried is to uh, you know we imagine a scenario like this, where we may have actually multiple 
transmitters transmitting to the same, say, base station, fusion center, whatever you want to call it. So, one of the idea that I I started thinking about it uh, a couple of years ago when I went to ICC in Budapest, and I realized that people are talking about massive MIMO for 5G. The idea of massive MIMO is a very interesting one, and there's a lot of, you know, discussion going on, and in fact, just two weeks ago, I was in a conference, and I was talking to some industry people, people and they were saying that they are building receivers which have over 100 antenna as base station. So, the way to think about massive MIMO is the following. Each of the elements here, or mobile terminal in that terminology, transmit its own sequence to base station. And so when you transmit one particular symbol from here, if you have 100 antenna at the receiver, how many copies of that symbol do you receive? 100 copies. However, these 100 copies each has been scaled by a different gain, which is the channel gain between the transmitter and the So you can think of it like CDMA. In CDMA, you transmit one symbol multiple time in time, across time. And each copy is scaled by a different gain as you go along the time. Then you have another user in your CDMA transmit its own sequence, but it uses a different set of gain. That is kind of signature. Mm -hmm. So at the receiver, you use a match filter for each user to receive its respective signal. Now, if you think of underwater, you can do exactly the same thing. And particularly in underwater, having a large number of hydrophone is not a big issue. In fact, it's a much simpler issue than in the case of electromagnetic channels. Yeah. Uh, you know, electronics and everything should be very high frequency and they become expensive. In underwater, of course, these are going to be expensive, but in underwater, uh, you know, we tend to think of very expensive equipment. So, so. Multiple transmitters would be a different, a different story, but, yeah. but multiple hydrophones, yeah. Yeah, so now the way that I see it is that each of these is transmitting and we receive with multiple large number of hydrophone and we match to the gains here and we extract the information from this sensor. And similarly for the rest of the sensors. Okay? We, have, we haven't had any chance to actually run this on in underwater, but I asked one of my um, parent students to look into this in a uh, simulated channel. So there is this uh, channel simulator, it's called Vertec or something. For, for underwater? For, for underwater. Actually, uh, <laughs> we got that from we mm -hmm. people. They gave us this. So what we do is that in this particular experiment, we started with four transmitters simultaneously. And then these four transmitters synchronize and they transmit a set of pilots at the beginning. And the pilots are uh, multi-carrier, like, you know, OFTM or filter bank, actually, in our case. And then, instead of sending three data, 
one pilot. Then each of the transmitters transmit three nulls at the three consecutive subcarriers and one pilot. And then another one transmits set of pilot at different subcarriers and so on. So we can kind of multiplex in frequency for set of uh, pilots and initialize the mesh filter at the receiver. And the receiver in this particular experiment was 64 hydrophone. As you see here, as we begin, we are not, if you think of this as I diagram, so ba basically this is time in second, and the dot point here are the uh, plus minus one information. This, this, this waveform, this waveform, is it, uh, is it uh, multi-carrier? Uh, it, it is multi-carrier. Okay, but there are a few, few carriers then, because, uh, because the, the, there are so many points but each okay. simple duration no, is, is very small. Because, you know, at each point here, uh, I think we have 128 subcarriers. So you see a total of 128 dots. And then ah, okay. we go to the next <laughs> okay, okay, okay. time slot and so on. Okay. Uh, so anyway, uh, yeah, some of the detail I should know, remember better, I don't quite remember. But uh, the key point is that, at least for it's working good. super fast but if we once we start the system we can run it for a very long time and you can send a very, very long burst and it's kind of reliable as you go along line detection uh, you know follow up and correct things still we need to do a lot of more work on the algorithm development and fine-tune it so but but if you think about this this is a effect, this is a binary, but it's a sing vestigial sideband. So if you think of it in terms of QAM, is like QPSK. So we are transmitting four QPSK uh, simultaneously. If I think of these four transmitters are belong to one transmitter, this actually is giving me eight bit per second per hertz which is very, very high bandwidth efficiency. <coughs> and if you can make it work for a four-level QAM, then it's going to be 16 bit per second per Hertz. That yeah, would be... Pro probably. That, uh, that, 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 that's already above above the, the channel capacity. Yeah. Pro channel capacity may be something on the order of 10. Uh, I mean, no one knows. Yeah. But people <laughs> speculate that maybe on the order of 10, yeah, it's, uh, but uh, it's kind of exciting to see that mm -hmm. you can do something like this. So each each of these plots is for a given for a given transmitter. Oh, you're, for, you're, yeah, yeah the different spatial. So, so you're you're taking all the all the the hydrophones and you're combining yeah. all their all the, the waveforms into a single single a single, single. waveform. What we have here, but imagine four of these. And actually, we assume that these four are, you know, co-located, not exactly co-located, but approximately co-located vertically in an array of four transmitters. Mm -hmm. And then at the distance of, I think, this test that we did was 100 meter for the simulated channel. And mm -hmm. then they transmit simultaneously. We transmit a preamble where we initialize okay. the gains. And mm -hmm. after that, we rely only on the line tracking. And if you look at the, if you look at the, um, so this, uh, this array of hydrophones, you can yeah. you can actually think of it as a as a 
to the to the beam former in, in this case. Yeah. So if you take if you take these coefficients that you learn from the pre preamble, and you and you will plot the the response of your beam former with these coefficients. So do you see beams, special beams that make sense? I mean, pointing to to the correct direction and not pointing at the others, or do uh, you see something that is less clear? Okay. Since we have multi-path here, this particular experiment or simulation was for shallow water where it's more difficult. Probably if we have, then, uh, you know, probably just looking at the mean doesn't make that much of sense. Mm -hmm. Because you are actually focusing on a point rather than having it. And one of the nice property of massive MIMO that have been discussed in the literature is that it's more than being formed. When you have very rich scattering environment, then you actually concentrate on the location of each user separate. Mm -hmm. No, we, did, we haven't gone to that extent to or yeah, but, 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 but when, when you when you uh, when you have massive when you have rich scattering, so I guess at, at your array you're going to get uh, energy coming from different uh, from these different directions. So yes, I can see that uh, it's as if the, the the beam forming is operating in the near field. Yeah. So it's it's fo focusing energy at a point not in one uh, not in one uh, direction yeah yeah here in one what in the water scattering may be, may be not the, you know deep water it may be actually nice beam for mm -hmm. effectively yeah so that would be also interesting to be explored for some you know other application that might be very much of interest you know if you are in some exploration and the sea and you go deep in the water and you want to transmit information out mm -hmm. that may work and and if you have and i like this sensor you know scenario because then they can be far from each other and then that will actually help you in defining your beams but, the, but the, this scheme for uh, for training the, the, the weights of the uh, of the, this, this combiner um, so don't you have an, an ambiguity? I mean, you're taking all the hydrophone signals and combining them into a single one. Then you still have to demodulate. No, no, no. We have one combiner or mesh filter for each of these. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But then for each, each of these combiners, will give you a single signal yeah. that is presumably uh, that uh, is a good. Uh, representative of the transmission from one of the from one of the users, but you still have, you still have to, no, but, to uh, demodulate the the. But uh, with the preamble, you initialize this so that it will be closely tuned to one of the sensors. Right. But afterwards, after the preamble, you have to track. Yeah. And there there are two things that you that you that you have to track. One of the one are, are the all the weights for this uh, for these elements. And the other one is after you demodulate the multi-carrier, there's this single equalizer that you also have to uh, that you also have to. No, actually, my equalizer is here. Oh. Okay. I don't have a single equalizer. There's no there's no follow up no, equalizer. Uh, multiply by a set of complex gain, and for each subcarrier, and add it together, you take the real Okay. So it's just this one, but this become these two become very nice. Yeah. Okay. Because otherwise, you could you would have an ambiguity that uh, yeah, of course, these weights. At no, the I, uh, no, I run over each other and they, yeah, and no, it, it can't be that way. No. But it would be that's one of the things that I'm very much interested to examine in a real environment and see how far we can go. Mm. Anyway, yeah, I think uh, 
just to maybe conclude, what's important is to say that filter bank has a lot to offer, more than what probably have, people have thought about in the past. It has definitely it's much superior to OFDM because OFDM by nature originally was designed for time and invariant case. And then uh, this particular application to massive MIMO setup, it seems to me that it's very promising and you know it can actually give a lot of chance to <coughs> either increase the rate between two point or have a kind of base station that receive from multiple mm -hmm. uh, sensors at different locations. Okay, yeah, I think it went pretty long, but hope. <laughs> yes, well, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, yeah. Any questions from you guys? <laughs> well, I didn't understand the details, but uh, I guess I, I received the, the general idea. Okay, good. That's the question. But so for your your design your design for uh, for the filter bank this alternative to to Yota and all the other things. So um, how um, black box like uh, can you currently make? It, I mean, uh, can you? Uh, is there a, is there a set of uh, of uh, methods functions that you can input? Uh, parameter of delay spread, Doppler spread, spread, and it will spit out uh, some uh, the, the pulse, the pulse design. Plus, there's a there's a there's a constraint, there's a constraint on the on the uh, on the complexity of the of the pulse, right? Okay. Um, yeah, I think the Hermit design has this flexibility that if say you know what's the spreading function of your channel, which is defined by these multi-paths that mm -hmm. you define, then you can optimize it for that particular situation. The, the results that I presented uh, for the, yeah, this one, actually the design was done based on delta tau times delta mu equal to point one. And then I get, you know, the rest. Data that is in my design. Mm -hmm. uh, however, if you do design for, you know, what's the, you know, at least have a good idea of what's Delta data and Delta U, and you design it for that particular point, probably, you will have some gain. I don't mm -hmm. know. Yeah, but I, I'm thinking uh, the 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 way that that, uh, that I have uh, that I have used the uh, FNT. It's well, it's in a in a different setup from yours because I I, I use far fewer carriers than, than you do. Um, but my 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 FMT design is what you have there as FMTC. Yeah. Right. Um, so I don't know how to design FMT DD, uh, either hexagonal or, or rectangular, and I'm thinking that most of the people uh, is either. So to uh, to push the, uh, the FMT into uh, these variants into wider visibility by the community, I guess you would need something. To give people something that they can easily use uh, in a, in a, for designing waveforms for an experiment for doing so, so I make make it something which is accessible to yeah which is research. accessible to non non uh, non experts to imp to design the pulses to implement the transmit and receive uh, filter banks because if yeah, if, this no, is, actually, if this is if this is available good. then people will will want to try and I mean. With these with these sorts of gains, it's definitely 
it's definitely worth a shot trying. Yeah. B, I can A come can also confirm what we have seen theoretically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, anyway, yeah, definitely something to be looked at. Yeah, maybe we can work together on mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yes. Get one of the students to sit down and write the code and publicize it and call everybody say, okay, come and download it from our website. Mm -hmm. yeah. One, yeah, actually, yeah, I had a follow-up question. Let me see if this is related to, to something that, uh, that Costas Rakanakis told me the other day. Let's see. Let me see if I can put him online. <laughs> okay. In the meantime, I was wondering on the, the last slide that you showed that you get that the convergence. Yeah. Uh, you have a preamble. Yeah. Right? Instead of using the pilots, you can just have a preamble. The preamble is just one time, yes. you know, one symbol at the beginning. Just one symbol? Yeah. And then the rest, the system will follow. Vasco, Vasco Luís, vocês estão a realizar os, os hangouts aqui do... Não, não, é de novo online. Usually use this these hangouts, this ecosystem. So I have a hard time. Mm 
let's see if he answers. So what uh, what I was saying is that, uh, uh, for example, at, um, at the NATO center, they have this this initiative. They call it the Janus Janus initiative. I don't know if you have read about this. It's all about standardizing uh, basic functionality for uh, underwater communications. Oh, okay. So the the take is that uh, um, yeah, they they talked about it last. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but so the modern basic functionality of of the of Janus is well basic. Um, I think that um, yeah, for the government. one might add other things, and this could be this could be one of them. One of the things. Yeah. No, actually, oh. it would be nice to oh. contribute and see if you know, there's a way of. So, do they have kind of regular meetings? That actually, I don't know. Actually, I don't know. Uh, ah, okay. Costas is that he's answering, but he's saying he doesn't have a mic. <laughs> So are you both PhD yeah. students now? No, uh, I have a scholarship until October and uh, I work on localization of underwater vehicles. So all the data comes to me already processed <laughs> <laughs> and I have to go through this thing. I get um, the, the, the delays from, from all the, the messages that we exchange between each other. And then we reconstruct the, the network. And so how do you do it? So by measuring the delay, you do the Yes, yes. So they don't have a synchronized clocks, so we have to to work with round trip times. And with that, we have uh, pairwise distances between them. Uh, and then we uh, reconstruct the network uh, up to a global rotation and, and flip. Because most of, most of the time we don't have anything. No, so, underwater uh, has a lot of aspects. Mm -hmm. it's more sounding, actually, it seems to be a lot more than competition. Yeah, so, so the, the, the way that um, that we have been uh, using FMT, and, and which is also his uh, 
he's also uh, done some work on, on FNT. Actually, he's... Oh, okay. in, a, in, 50, in 50 minutes, <laughs> actually, it took long. Um, brought me to make arrangement to stay. <laughs> but so the, uh, the the stuff, the, the way that, that we that we use this is with fewer with fewer subcarriers, and then we equalize with. Uh, yeah, actually, I, I think most of the FMT is doing it wider. Mm -hmm. The other day, I was I was presenting this at uh, at uh, at Oceans, and. Um, and Josko Josko Katipovic from uh, I don't know what he is now some warfare center. <laughs> so he was asking a, a question. So I, in my presentation, I, I mentioned that you uh, use FNT uh, OFDM style with many subcarriers and single tap equalization, but we use uh, or FNT single carrier style <laughs> with few subcarriers and the time domain equalization. Um, but so. Potentially, we could span, we could span the the the, the range of subcarriers from small to, to to large. And he was asking how how could you decide uh, in a given in a given scenario what's the good what's the good the um, the good number of subcarriers what's the, the, the most appropriate number of subcarriers and once you decide on that. Um, I wonder what's the the good structure of the of the receiver. I mean, so you're using uh, 100 or 200 subcarriers. Say that you that you come to the conclusion that 50 50 subcarriers would be the correct uh, the, the best the, the best choice. A large number of hydrophone. Mm -hmm. uh, you can reduce number of subcarriers significantly. And mm -hmm. the reason for that is that you can imagine that each channel has some response. And then what you do is that you kind of average all these responses. So... Yeah, you get something that is much flatter and... Much flatter, yeah. So it's, uh, in fact, yeah, the results that I presented, one thing that I forgot to mention is that the bandwidth was around 60 hertz per subcarrier, not to hertz anymore. Mm -hmm. 60. And, and that actually helps you with better tracking because then your symbol rate is faster, you have, you do more of it per second. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah. Yeah, I don't know how you how you would. Uh, it's, it's, if if I come to the conclusion that I would like those fifty carriers, and if the channel is not benign, so uh, I still need to do uh, temporal equalization. But I have uh, these fifty these fifty carriers. So I'm wondering what's the uh, What's the good structure for the for the for the receiver? Should I combine? Should I combine subcarriers? Should I do uh, temporal processing on on? Uh, it's hard to say. <laughs> yeah. But I think one guess is that you with large number of hydrophones you you know actually in the, we, we published a number of papers in massive mind using <coughs> so i introduced that in also in that area and i have some collaborators in ireland in college that they did most of the work and yeah we have published three or four conference paper and we have a book chapter to write now, and uh, you know, it's uh, we call it self equalization. It's kind of it equalizes by itself. Mm -hmm. What what do you mean self? Uh, 
so when you you know per sub carrier your channel still you have some frequencies uh, selectivity however you to combining of the signals from large receiver antenna and combining the number of channels that each of them has different response they some equalization we have. Mm -hmm. yes. And in fact, for massive MIMO, some people have gone further and have said that you can use single carrier because of this averaging the mm -hmm. you know, frequency selectivities will be averaged down. But it might be kind of if you have too much of dispersion, it's not going to happen. It may not be sufficient. Understand. Yeah. So this key, this massive MIMO scheme that, that you are saying, when you when you combine the the various uh, signals at the massive array, so you are imagining that you are using one coefficient, one coefficient per per. per I mean, per I, I said you can do match filtering. Yeah, with match filtering, you could have time time dispersion and still. Yeah, this would work. It, I mean, it's just time to learn something. Yeah, exactly. So this would align, align everything. Mm -hmm. So that definitely is possible. But then uh, you, if you try to do time reversal, then you lose the blind equalization. Mm -hmm. At least won't be as easy. Yeah, Still, you may be able to do something, but then if you have too many coefficients to adopt. Then the step size has to be chosen much smaller and then tracking will become an issue. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's, uh, but there is a lot of, of new, I mean, thing to be thought of. It's, it's just beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely, definitely, this needs more. This needs more visibility. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's a good point to do something to kind of make it more accessible to everybody and encourage people to use it. Mm -hmm. The way that you, the way that you, that you structure the, the um, in practice in your, uh, in your code, the way that you structure the, the transmitter and. Uh, the receiver, uh, those two parts of the of the filter bank, is it is it like in the in the plot that you showed at the at the begin, beginning of your presentation? Though that there's um, oversampling, oversampling, then there's filtering, then yeah. you go through the channel, then there's matched filtering, there's decimation. Is it the way that you that you implement the the filter bank, or do you or do you use? Uh, uh, more efficient structures with polyphase. Uh, no, we, when we, it comes to implementation, of course, we use polyphase. But polyphase also is efficient implementation of the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Because we, we don't use we don't use polyphase. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> in our uh, in our uh, the way that we that, that, that yeah, we the, the, the filter band it, it, it's come. it's just the dumbest the dumbest way. So we we, we directly follow. That uh, that processing uh, chain there, but of course it's not it's not especially. <laughs> no, actually, I, I have a number of uh, programs that one of my students has written for FMT and CMT and SMT for all of them that are polyphase based. Mm -hmm. Have you have you seen my software radio work? Have, have I sent it to you? Or? Mm -hmm. I okay. can send you a PDF copy. Yeah. Yeah. And then I have a CD for the book on my website that has all these SMT CMT codes in it. That might be. So the I didn't so so you you in your slide you showed three variants FMT, SMT and, uh, and, CM, and CMT. CMT. But but so CMT is like a, a, I didn't quite I didn't quite uh, I'm not familiar with that, but it's like a a real version of, of uh, FMT? Uh, no.
TMT actually was the very first of multi-carrier system that was proposed mm -hmm. in 1965. Mm -hmm. so, uh, it was done by a person from Bell Lab by the name Chang. He said, that, okay, I can transmit ham symbols uh, using vestigial sign. Also, you know, the way that this is actually a very interesting answer. If you think about Nyquist, so we have zero t two t minus t minus two t. Now, if I design my Nyquist bars such that the zero crossing will be double. That's equivalent to making my bandwidth one half. Yes. Now, if I transmit a real symbol here, and then I transmit and imaginary symbol and T then actually still I'm transmitting every T one symbol mm -hmm. but is one real symbol I see but I have used half of the bandwidth because I did residual sign. My filter is uh, kind of slower changing or in time narrower band in frequency. So it's the same, you know, efficiency in terms of use of bandwidth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Chang came up with this you know, idea of making the bandwidth half vestigial side band and then transmit successive symbols in phase quadrature in And, you know, he did drive equations that was the condition for to have this orthogonal basis. But the way that the orthogonal defined actually is in real domain and complex domain. Mm -hmm. And then that, uh, another guy from Bell Lab a year later published another paper that actually presented to me the same concept with saying that I transmit quant signals. However, the in-phase and quadrature are staggered by half a symbol interval, which is the same thing. Mm -hmm. But then a number of papers that I have read, people say that, okay, I don't want to use the Chang method because chain method requires, uh, you know, single side band, and there will be some sort of Hilbert transform involved, that, and that makes things more complex. Mm -hmm. But when I look at it and I implement it, they have exactly the same complexity. They have the same. But sometimes, depending on looking at it as offset quant 
or you can at it as chain methods, what I call CMT, make it easier. When I look at it at CMT, then I can introduce the concept of line equalization much easier. But fundamentally, both are the same. Mm -hmm. They are not really different. It's not that much different. <laughs> Yeah, if you look at my signal trust in Sing magazine paper, I ha I've gone through some I have read it once but a while back. Let's remember. Okay. <laughs> Let's remember. Yeah, there was some of the Yeah, let's okay. see what we can do. I think uh, it would be nice if we can have a conference call or something with Costa. Mm -hmm. he's yes, interested. So his connectivity at the, at the center is, is, uh, is no, always, I mean, always uh, problematic, but, but we, we, can, we can arrange. In, uh, in Salt Lake, you know. Yeah, we, we, we can arrange. Yeah, but, but we can arrange this. This, uh, I mean, with sufficient uh, uh, time. He can get permission to have a Skype connection, and we can we can do a we can do a conference. Yeah, call. I found usually a Skype is the easiest one. Yeah, 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 yeah. It is. Um, so when when are you going back to the Salt Lake? Actually, I will be in Europe for half more weeks, so we are going back on thirteenth of June. Okay. So after here. I, you know, week of June 6 is ICC, which is in London. Mm -hmm. So I have a one week in between. <coughs> I plan to go to Germany now after Germany. this conference. Yeah. Okay. My sister lives there. Okay. And then another two, the other two sisters also have come from Iran. So we have, we have a week of reunion there. Uh -huh. Which is nice. So I'm looking forward to meeting them. Yeah, one of my sister actually came to the US last year, so it's a bit that long. Mm -hmm. in, in Iran, they, they are living in uh, Isfahan? Yeah, they are in Isfahan. Mm -hmm. so both of my sisters are, and my mom and one brother. They are all here. So your conference, your conference here in Lisbon, this is going to be uh, This is the East Coast uh, Circuit Sense System. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. not usually my conference. <laughs> I, actually, we, we have quite a, a announcements for a number of talks, uh, and usually large number of talks this uh, this week. I guess it's mostly from uh, people who will come to this conference. Oh. <laughs> so there are like four, four uh, special special talks. Uh, this one, but there was one yesterday, and there will be two more. <laughs> I guess oh. people from uh, that have come from for the, for the <coughs> yeah. So now it's uh, we we did a circuit design. A couple of my students did that for uh, one of the project that we are looking at cosmic ray. I think I told you about that. Mm -hmm. We are trying to see if we can use radar to see cosmic ray. Oh. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think you have to prepare for the next. Yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah. actually, I was, I was uh, originally, I was planning on, uh, on, on uh, taking you to a to a nearby restaurant for uh, no, I Portuguese think, food. I, but I, I, I am good. I had the yeah, paper this, first, uh, yeah. Actually, yeah. this was the, this the his thesis was scheduled after after we uh, oh, okay. we uh, we set up our. Uh, our uh, this uh, this seminar and uh, two o'clock is a uh, is a, a bit awkward time for a uh, for a discussion for a discussion, but it's the time slot that was available, so we just oh, took okay. it. Yeah, Otherwise, yeah. we will have to delay back for tomorrow. Yes. No, it was nice to come and see you, and now I have much better idea about how equipped you are. You guys are here. Terms of underwater. Yeah, and as I told you in uh, in uh, 
back in Italy in, in September, uh, the NATO Center. They also have they also have a very uh, very nice uh, setup for for communications. There is this structure. They, 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 this uh, test bed that they call the Loon, L O O N. Actually, John Potter mentioned this in, yeah. his, in his presentation. So it has a number of. Uh, it's I guess they they use it mostly for networking studies. But so what they have is uh, four tripods sitting on the bottom of the of the of the sea near Aspetia, and these are equipped with several types of modems. I think three three types of modems each one. One from Bentos, one from Evologix, one from Woods Hole. Um, and one of them is equipped with an arbitrary arbitrary source, and one of the tripods is equipped with three with uh, three or four hydrophones. So it's very easy uh, to broadcast a signal from the, this uh, this arbitrary source and do the recordings on the three on the three hydrophones and it's doing a, a at sea experiment with almost zero uh, with almost zero uh, hassle so how is that is this kind of can be done remotely or yes it can it can i haven't never done this but uh, the one of the, the one of our collaborators uh, he's actually in, uh, in, he's in, the, in in the nato now he used to be in, in the underwater robotics group um but so he has uh, routinely he tells me wow we should do <laughs> you can you are most welcome to use this so you should prepare signals and let's transmit etc so apparently it's very it's very easy to to do uh, yeah that would be so they are there is one transmitter and four hydrophones there's at least one transmitter and and, uh, and three hydrophones in one in one tripod oh. i don't know but maybe in the other tripods there are hydrophones as well i'm not sure about that um but so point to point or point to three close points i would say uh, definitely how, how you far could, are the tripods uh they're about one kilometer apart the, the maximum distance is one kilometer. There are some that are, that are, that are close. Are they moving or they are No, no, no. They are, they are moving on, on the bottom. Yes. So it's, it's a more benign, more benign channel. Uh, as I, as I, I think I told you uh, uh, before that our, our, our underwater vehicles, we can also use them as test beds for, uh, for, uh, for communications. The, uh, the modems, the modems that we have, which are from Evologix, the firmware doesn't allow us to transmit arbitrary, arbitrary signals yet. Uh, I have talked with Konstantin Kepkow, you know, the guy, the guy from Evologix. He was also there at the, mm -hmm. the conference, conference in Italy. And I have told him that, yeah, well, it would be very handy for us to transmit arbitrary waveforms. And he says, well, you know, yes. Several of our customers have already asked for this, so we are looking into this. Uh, it's not a big priority, but he was receptive. So, um, yeah. since the guys in Evologix have the, this history of uh, actually implementing these sorts of requests, at least for the networking part in our in our in our projects, they have done several very useful modifications to their uh, to their software uh, so my guess is that if he says he's committed to this it will happen sooner or, or later and then we can uh, we can uh, yeah we can uh, transmit stuff from uh, from our uh, from our vehicles so we can have all the all the mobile setups which is where this where, uh, where filter bank will really shine <laughs> compared with the uh, with the uh, OFDM yeah I think this still you can you know there's always some improvement to be shown mm -hmm. so depending on the channel yeah you know, sometimes the channel is like you know we were looking at some uh, doppler spread and we run some experiment in OE and it was OSDM was not that far from filter break. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think some in some and channels. And my curve also show that, you know, with mm-hmm. Marsh and low mobility. The, you know, in, in the conference in Italy, you saw the, this presentation by this Norwegian guy uh, on uh, replay replay methods, where they had where he had she showed these delay Doppler spread functions for several test sites where they have done, and some of these are poor. <laughs> the length yeah. is so no. Sometimes it's it just depends. Sometimes even the same location depending on the day. Yeah, it's horrible. Maybe absolutely horrible sometimes. So this, uh, the, the, the plots that you were showing for, for uh, the, the delay Doppler. Yeah. Uh, an appropriate, an appropriate number for most uh, cases, but there are some, uh, there are some really, really, really nasty uh, channels where this may be as, as high as one. <laughs> Uh, for a real overspread uh, channel, but I don't even know how you how you communicate in, in such are channels. People, hmm? people are able to communicate under this channel. I think Tim Prysik, he had this. Uh, he had a couple of years back. He had two students, one Norwegian, uh, Trin Egan, and another Chinese, Wei Chang Li. Uh, they did. They did their PhD thesis on communication over uh, time varying channels. Um, and I know that they operated over unusually large Mach numbers, but not not one, I would guess. I mean, yeah. with, with one, there's basically nothing you can do. Yeah. <laughs> At least there's nothing I can do. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much. Yeah, Hope you guys you. enjoyed this. <laughs> we have only 20 minutes to presentation. <laughs> I don't want to yeah, but, pull your nerve too much. <laughs> yeah, he's a, he's a, he's presenting in, in Portuguese. So oh, okay. Present. Okay. I do not do much good, do much good anyway. But, oh, okay. Qual é a sala? A sala de reuniões. A sala de reuniões. Ok. So, taxis should be easy to get hmm? here. The taxis are available out there? Yeah, the, the easiest way. I'll show you. The black one? Yeah, the black one. Oh, so you, you, when you leave the, the tower, actually, I'll, I'll go downstairs with you. But then you walk to the Holiday Inn, and just before there's a, there's oh, yeah. a taxi stop. Oh, yeah, the taxi stop. Hotel, definitely. Yeah. Oh, actually, well, my hotel is not that far from here. Mm -hmm. This was just yeah, yeah. The, 10, 15 minutes at most. There's a, there's a nice... Uh, There's a, there's even a, the, the, the metro, the metro. Yeah, but anyway, they, yeah, of course, taxi, taxi yeah, is only money. five euro. So mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, ta taxis, taxis in, uh, taxis in are, 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 are cheap. Yeah, we bought the, uh, you know, the yellow bus pass. It was just waste of money. <laughs> we didn't use it much. We bought two days. It's 60 bucks. So. To, to ride the, the tramway, the 28. This is uh, this is one of the tourist routes. Oh, we used to have a lot of tram lines here in, in Lisbon. Um, no, I actually we did quite a bit, uh, and the, there's a. Um, but the, the 28, the 28 is, is very, is very popular with, with tourists. Sometimes you go to the, to the first stop yeah. and uh, it's just a line of tourists enough to fill two or three of them. <laughs> but it's very picturesque, but it's, it's a very nice ride. No, I mean, we 
we have enjoyed the city a lot. You were right on the week during what Saturday, Sunday? Uh, actually, it, uh, yeah, we came Saturday and uh, yeah, we went out and Sunday also quite a bit. Then yesterday, I went to conference and you know, came in the evening again. We went out, so we enjoy. And of course, you know, when your wife is with you, she wants to go out all the time. <laughs> So if you are busy, I, I can find my way. No, I, I, no, I, 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 especially busy now. Я же был в